Okay, so um, I'm trying to be um, coherent as much as I can after 48 hours of travel. So what I decided to do is give a bit of a, you know, pers well, introduction from my perspective, an entomologist's perspective, obviously, but also a research entomologist. So I'm not primarily a collection manager, obviously. I'm a research scientist with interest in biodiversity data. So I thought I might um, talk a little bit about where our biodiversity data really come from, which means I'm talking about biological collections, but then also biodiversity inventories and data quality and a few things that just came to mind um, introducing this topic. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is going to be complicated because you yeah, can just press all of them, please. <laughs> Okay, I thought um, in addition to the little introduction um, we had earlier, I just wanted to briefly say who I am, um, where I'm from, what I've been doing, and so on and so forth. So if you have questions on anything, you can um, ask me, obviously. So I'm originally from Germany. I did my um, master's degree at the um, University of Tübingen in Germany. Um, my master's, my actual master's project, I did in southern Brazil, where I started working on the group of insects I study, still most of the time, those belong to the Hemiptera. They're called Redovidi or assassin bugs. So you're going to be seeing a lot of Redovidi examples in my slides, obviously. Um, then I went, moved to Berlin, um, where I did my PhD, working on assassin bug phylogenetics mostly. So I was just tearing apart specimens and studying their morphology at that point. Um, then I moved to the American Museum of Natural History, where I became a postdoc in a PBI project, a Planetary Biodiversity Inventory project on plant bugs. And I started becoming a lot more involved in actual descriptive taxonomy, which is something I hadn't really done before. Um, since 2007, I'm at the University of California in Riverside, and I have my own lab, and we're all interested in systematics biodiversity and evolutionary biology of true bugs, the heteroptera, with emphasis on the red VAD, but also plant bugs, and in a few other groups. Okay, and this is what I, you know, when I look at the, um, the biodiversity side of my lab, this is really what we're interested in. So we're interested in generally in biodiversity research, and our projects have regional to global projects, including research on groups of medical and agricultural importance. I'm, the university I'm at is called a land-grant university. This means we have a mission to serve the agricultural part of our state, and California is a very important agricultural state in the United States, so we always have to keep that in mind as well. Um, a lot of what we're doing is really revisionary taxonomy, um, so we describe new species, we revise genera, and so on and so forth. We're also interested in biogeography, meaning we want to know, you know, historical biogeography when I say it like that. Um, we want to know where the taxa came from, essentially, and those distrib distributions we see today, we try to understand through the phylogenetic the relationships really of these organisms. We're also interested in multi-trophic um, inter um, ecological interactions. One side of it has to do with insects that are herbivorous, feed on plants. That means we also have to look at the plants. This is why I'm friends with Melissa and Kim. And we're also looking at the parasitoids because again, this is an agriculturally really important um, aspect. And then on the other side, I'm interested in, because assassin bugs are really predators, um, I'm interested in these predator-prey interactions. So because I'm a university teacher, obviously, it means I'm interested in training, public outreach, and conservation more broadly. And this is also part of what we're doing. Thank you. OK, so if you ever want to know more about true bugs, this is where you want to go. You Google Heteroptera Systematics at UCR, and you get to our um, lab homepage. And um, really, sort of my involvement in these um, biodiversity-focused projects over the last few years were um, Red Viet PEAT project, and um, Partnership for Enhancing Expertise and Te Taxonomy project, on assassin bugs, where I'm the only um, principal investigator. And that's a fairly large training grant in taxonomy and biodiversity research focusing on this group. Then I'm involved in the project with Melissa and Kim. They're called ADBC projects, which stands for Advancing the Digitization of Biological Collections. Both of them are big or were 
big national US National Science Foundation programs. And fairly recently, I started on another project that uses a lot of the same methods. Um, it's called ARTS. People love their acronyms, obviously. Advancing Revolutionary Taxonomy and Systematics. It focuses on a different group of true bugs. Um, I'm also the incoming director for the UCR Center for Integrative Biological Collections, something that we, an initiative that we started fairly recently because we felt in this university environment, our dispersed biological collections were not really getting enough attention. So we try to focus the, especially the administrators, a little bit more on what we're doing and try to promote what we're doing. Okay, so with this just very briefly, um, two, two big words that you know, everyone dealing with biodiversity obviously is very aware of. So we're all, we know we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis with species extinction rates estimates vary um, greatly obviously, but it's a real thing and it's a real problem. And for a lot of that we're relying on biodiversity informatics and taxonomic information to manage, conserve, use, and share the biodiversity or the knowledge about biodiversity. And obviously being a systematist and taxonomist, one of the problems that are very obvious is what is another big catchword is called a taxonomic impediment. And it means there's a shortage of this important taxonomic information. There are gaps in our taxonomic knowledge and the shortage of trained taxonomists and curators is becoming a real big problem, obviously. Okay. <coughs> so what I want to do for the next um, few minutes is really briefly talk about biological collections, how they're really important, what's in them, and what are the good and bad things about them, really, to put it briefly. And then the other thing I want to briefly talk about some biodiversity inventories, because obviously both these are really important sources of the biodiversity data we're looking at. Up here you see our small entomological research museum. Um, it's a relatively small building, small collection. You see some more details on that. And below are some of the uh, field work projects I've been involved in or I've been leading essentially. Okay, so we've heard that before. Obviously specimens are not very useful when they're just locked away somewhere in a cabinet in a drawer, which means we really need to get vouchered specimen data out there, which means we have to dis digitize specimen records and digitizing can mean like various things obviously but very often it means getting the actual specimen records or the data on the labels or tags out there but then also getting images of the specimens out there as well so when I talk about digitizing I could mean either one of them obviously then they become available to the widest possible community out there and then they can be used for all sorts of other purposes okay. Okay, so being an entomologist, obviously I'm looking at them from the entomological perspective. And you would say that entomological collections and inventory should really play a very central role in biodiversity inf um, initiatives or biodiversity informatics. And it's fairly obvious why that should be so. It's because um, they occur in most terrestrial systems. They're incredibly speciose, obviously there's millions of species out there. They're important. They can be of medical, veterinary, agricultural, so on and so forth, importance out. Um, they're also dramatically understudied, obviously, in most areas around the world, which is you know, a good and a bad thing at the same time. And then also compared to the vertebrate and plant people, we don't understand areas of endemism and hotspots as well as those groups do. So this is why we think, you know, Entomology should be really central, but when you go with one of my colleagues, Norm Johnson, in 2007 said, you know, he defined biodiversity informatics up on top, and then he says, and that's obviously true, the development of this field has been driven largely by the botanical and vertebrate research communities. Entomologists as a whole have been reluctant participants. And he further says that this is so possibly because even a modest sized insect collection is one or two orders of magnitude larger than herbaria or vertebrate collections with comparable staffing and budgets. We've heard that before. 
And those are two examples. So the USNM, um, United States National Museum at the Smithsonian Institutions, this is only the entomology collection. They have 35 million specimens. <laughs> That's the second largest insect collection out there after the Natural History Museum in London. And I got the number of technical staff they have to take care of their collection from their web page. And I think this information actually is not updated. I think that number has decreased since then. I think it's about 12 technical staff taking care of 35 million specimens. Okay, a not quite so dramatic um, example is ERM stands for Entomological Research Museum. This is the museum at the university I'm based at. And again, in entomology, we have about 3 million specimens. So we're one of the small collections. We're one of the fairly good-sized university collections. But obviously, overall, we're a small collection. And we really only have one technical staff and then the support of students, undergrad students and grad students in part as well. Okay. So, and I would claim that since 2007, things have actually started to change quite well. And you know, it's very good for the entomological community. I'm claiming that entomology-driven projects have accelerated the field of biodiversity informatics in great part because of the challenges that need to be overcome, because of these massive numbers of specimens and really serious understaffing. I know it's a pain. Okay, so um, just briefly, the outline of the, um, the rest of my, um, my reflections, to put it that way, um, a few more words about existing biological collections, new specimen data, and a few things on collection curation, really. So you know, that has to do with data quality, essentially. OK, so existing biological collections. And it is anything, obviously, from the big natural history repositories all the way down to small specialized collections that can be associated with universities, research institutions. Some of them are private institutions. Or then field stations, for example, very frequently have fairly small, but they could be quite interesting um, insect collections associated with them. And of course, because it's such a diverse group of collections, they will have different priorities, challenges, and solutions to these challenges. But what has become clear, I think, over the last 10, 20 years is what is very beneficial is that if all these entities, the big collections, and the small collections on a, on a global, international basis start talking to each other and sharing you know, their problems and discussing the problems. So what we have in um, North America, and it's a very useful um, little, very loose association. It's called the Entomological Collections Network. They meet once a year, and typically in association with the Entomological Society of America meetings. And this is essentially a all the, oh, most of the curators from the bigger collections get together and we're just talking about things. We're talking about problems, we're talking about initiatives, and so on and so forth. Um, at a much larger level, that also happens across all biological collections. So Spinach is the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. And this is actually worthwhile stuff to look at. So for example, some of the ECN meetings had their PowerPoint presentations made available. So you can just browse through them and look at them and see what they're talking about. And same for resources with some of the other, um, the other societies. OK, challenges. Obviously, challenges for museums, you can look at them from two sides. You can look at them from the management side, and you can look at them from the user community. So I'm more the user community, really, than the management. Um, for the management, obviously, one of the big problems around the globe is research shortage. So there's not enough technical staff. There's not enough space. There's not enough insect doors, and so on and so forth. That's a very clear thing. But I really want to focus on some of the user community. And that user community would be taxonomists all the way to conservation biologists' problems. So one of our complaints are the collections are dispersed. That means that specimen data or the specimens even are inaccessible. It's very hard to know what's out there. Um, of course, we expect that the specimens we want to look at are prepared, curated, and identified. And we also think that specimens ideally should come with 
electronic data already there, so we don't have to capture some of the data again. But obviously often they don't. Okay, here are just three examples. Obviously, if you're interested in biodiversity, insect biodiversity, anywhere in Africa, pretty much those are the three, at least for the groups of insects I work on, those are the three museums you really cannot ignore. The Natural History Museum in London, the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris, and the uh, Royal Museum for Central Africa in Terwirin. But obviously, if we're interested in finding out what's in these collections, well, we have to maybe the opportunity to go there, but obviously that's really expensive for most of us. Um, and then also depending on the questions you're asking, you might not even be able to just go to one museum. You will have to go to all three and maybe, maybe even additional museums as well. Okay, similar. So it's really hard to know what is actually there. Because um, detailed and electronically available specimen holding records are often 